One of my uh, one of my childhood heroes growing up was this man. His name is Alan Alda, and he was in the TV series MASH during my formative years from about 1973, I guess, until 1981. Um, uh, this article is, is an interview in ARP magazine, and it reflects on on all in all his uh, ongoing careers and uh, it's entitled all all in all that is obsessed right about science and other things he kind of looks like my dad the face does and the loss of hair now um alan alder is obsessed with the power of science there's an asterisk here and wants you to be too and wants you to be too some 40 years after um, MASH ended, the beloved actor and advocate remains passionate about laughter, respect, and the facts. Uh, the interview is by David Hoffman. Alan Alda isn't, um, isn't letting social distancing keep him from the people he loves. Soon after Alda, 84, and Arlene, 87, his wife of 63 years, quarantined themselves in their home uh, in, on Long Island, they began holding uh, video chats with friends and families via Zoom, the popular video conferencing app. The other night, we had dinner virtually with three couples, says Alda, who, using uh, Zoom's virtual background feature, put up a gorgeous travel video of Italy during cocktails. I'm a little bit ahead of my uh, friends digitally. For years, I've been fixing their computers, and I call my service celebrity tech support the slogan is why let a nobody touch your stuff alan alda lands the joke with that winning ear-to-ear -ear smile uh, i can tell because we're zooming uh to his presence as reassuring on my laptop screen as it was all those years on the beloved tv war comedy mash his iconic surgeon character benjamin franklin hawkeye pierce uh brought intelligence wit and sanity to a world of chaos, which most wars are, much as Alda himself is doing now. In the nearly four decades since MASH signed off with what remains the most watched episode in television history, the six-time Emmy recipient has focused on something way broader than show business. He wants us all to relate and communicate. Um, the subtitle for the next page is Pockets of people still think science is just an opinion. Pockets of people think science is just an opinion. Um, in his podcast uh, called Clear Plus Vivid with Alan Alda, which launched in 2008, um, 18, and featured such has featured such megawatt guests as Tom Hanks and Paul McCartney, hinges on communication. It's just two people really listening to each other for 45 minutes. If one subject stands out in these heart to heart, it's science. For 11 years, Alda, who describes himself as the walking question mark, was the engaging host of Scientific American Frontiers, a PBS show in which he got brainy engineers, medical researchers, and Nobel laureates to talk uh, more like the rest of us. He turned the gig, in, the gig into a full-time mission. In 2009, he established the Alan Alda Center for Communicating Science at Stony Brook University on Long Island, where he loosens up scientists using improvisational techniques he learned during 50 years of acting. Some 15,000 participants have come through ALDA communication training so they can better share their critical work with clarity and passion. People are dying because we can't communicate in ways that allow us to understand one another, ALDA explained in his 2017 book. If I understand you, would I have this look on my face? Uh, that sounds like an exaggeration, but I don't think it is. When patients can't relate to their doctors and don't know their orders, when engineers can't convince a town that the dam could break, when a parent can't win the trust of a child to warn her uh, off an illegal substance uh, or a lethal drug, they can all be headed for serious endings. Communicating science matters more than ever these days in Alda, uh, not only is he in the age group most at risk for COVID-19, uh, 
19, he is also battling Parkinson's disease, another illness with no cure. Alda doesn't let that get him down. If anything, he finds inspiration in mysteries yet to be unraveled. We don't value our ignorance enough, he notes, in a candid, wide-ranging, and frequently hilarious conversation. Ignorance is really good to have if it's combined with curiosity, and scientists are professional curiosity machines. We should all imitate that as much as possible. Now it's clear uh, that our lives depend on it. What has been, uh, what has life been like for you since the outbreak of the coronavirus? All the answers. I'm having a good time under the circumstances. The other day we were walking six feet apart with friends in a secluded area and I said, what's the best thing that's happened since this began? One friend looked at me with a kind of stupefied expression like, what do you mean, best? What's good about it? But I found a lot of positive things. I'm very happy about some of the changes we've had to go through. For one thing, my wife Arlene, who's an author of eight, 19 books, is looking for ways to be creative uh, during this time. So she's gone back to painting and drawing and she plays the piano every day. And she's experimenting with cooking. She looks into something, uh, sometimes uh, empty refrigerator and comes up with a delicious meal somehow. I haven't eaten this well since the last epidemic. Uh, question. You've been advocating for years for better communication around science. Are we finally getting the message through to society? One of the most basic things I've tried to do is give people a greater understanding of how science works, the importance of evidence, the importance of many trials of rigorous studies, and the idea that we learn only a little bit at a time. No single study is the end all answer for everything. Making people aware of that process helps increase appreciation and respect for science. And that helps us make informed decisions for our families and ourselves. Unfortunately, I probably need another 25 years to help the culture achieve trust in science overall, because there are pockets of people who still think science is just another opinion. That mindset puts us all in danger because it can infect people across the country. So I'm very concerned about the casual attitude many people have towards science. There are bright spots. I think infectious diseases expert Anthony Fossey is doing a wonderful job. He's straddling two worlds, science and belief. It's like that silent, silent movie shot where someone's balancing on top of a moving truck, uh, and, trucks, excuse me, and they are getting further and further apart. And his legs are spreading as far as they can, but Fossey, who was on my podcast in March, comes closest to being the national figure most trusted by the rest of the country. With information changing so quickly, it's hard to know what to believe. Alan Alda continues. Well, you have to check the source. There's a lot of fake information there. Gargle with this, hold your breath for 10 seconds. If the only source is my cousin who knows somebody who knows somebody in the health field, that's not a reliable source and can do more harm than good. Uh, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention or the World Health Organization, those are the best resources and you've got to go straight to their websites to see what they have to say. I also cross-check information at um, a fact-finding website such as snopes.com as often as I can. But beyond that, in a fundamental way, there's a problem we have now that we haven't had before, which is that we're operating within our own circles of kinship and friendship and information. That's why we can't communicate very well with people outside that circle. Um, Again, we're doing reading about the interview with Alan Alda, and Alden Alda does a lot of interviews with other people. Uh, like I said, he looks a little bit like my dad, uh, so I really like the guy. Uh, any advice on getting out of our own little bubbles? Alda says, the scientists I've interviewed tell me it's a good idea to spread the information you know to be correct with those outside your circle. If there's anybody you know whom you don't ordinarily communicate with, and who has his or her own circle, try to include that person so we can extend our reach with real information, also with encouragement. Mental health is as important as physical health. They're intertwined. I'm talking like I'm an expert, but I've only been studying this for 25 years. I've been studying communication all my life and I'm still not very good at it. 
But yeah, this is good advice. Somehow spread or share your information outside your own circles. Um, you survived the polio as a kid. What do you remember about that e epidemic? Um, Alda admits, I got it when I was seven. I had a stuffy nose at a Warner's movie theater, honking the whole evening. I couldn't clear my nose. When I got home, I threw up and my legs were unsteady. The next day I had a stiff neck. I couldn't sit up in bed. My parents called the doctor, went to the hospital, had a spinal tap. I was in the hospital for two weeks, but then I had about six months of therapy devised by Elizabeth Kenny, the famous nurse from Australia. I had nearly scald, I had nearly scalding blankets wrapped around my limbs every hour. It was hard on me. It was harder, I think, on my parents who couldn't afford a nurse and had to torture me themselves. It's always better to pay somebody else to torture your kid. Hmm. Hope that's not a reflection on me. All right. Um, here's Alan Alda and his wife down here of 63 years. Um, it doesn't appear that Parkinson's disease has slowed you down much, if at all. How did you first discover you had it? In 2015, I read an article in the New York Times by Jane Brody in which a couple of doctors said some of their Parkinson's patients had one particular early symptom, and it's an unusual one. People act out their dreams while they're asleep. I realized I had done just that. I had dreamed somebody was attacking me, and in the dream, I threw a sack of potatoes at him. In reality, I threw my pillow at my wife. So believing there was a good chance I had Parkinson's, I went to a neurologist and asked for a brain scan. He examined me and didn't think it was necessary. Um... I have to continue on page 60 of this wonderful magazine. I don't think you need a scan. You don't have a symptom, uh, I, I was told. Well, I'd really like the scan anyway, I said. And he called me back and said, boy, you really got it. Wow, how did you react? I began to exercise. A lot of people here, they have Parkinson's and get depressed and panicky and don't do anything. Just hoping it'll all go away. It's not going to, but you can hold off the worst symptoms. Movement helps, walking, biking, treadmills, but also special things. I move to music a lot. I take boxing lessons from a guy trained in Parkinson's therapy. I do a full workout specifically designed for this disease. It's not the end of the world when you get this, this diagnosis. It's a good point. And a friend of mine, um, uh, Kevin Williams, is, has had Parkinson's for several years, and he's working out really well. And I suggest you guys who have it, uh, do all the exercises you're told, and even find some other ones that will help you better. Okay. Um, you've incorporated Parkinson's into roles in the film uh, Marriage Story and on TV's Ray Donovan. That character's tremor was more advanced than yours, right? Whenever they did close-ups of my hand, I was supposed to be shaking a bit, so I had to fake it. My hands didn't shake that much then. Now I could give them a good shake. It's been almost 40 years since MASH ended. Do you think a carousing womanizer like Hawkeye Pierce could survive on TV in today's uh, Me Too era? That's an excellent question. That was the negative side of Hawkeye. He was a uh, woman, a carouser, and a drinker. Even in that era, I was, as you probably know, a very outspoken feminist. And I wasn't just talking about it. I was trying in every way to work from that point of view in my life. We had many discussions on MASH, even before we started shooting, to help shift the vision of the character from the male schoolboy approach. I was able to win a lot of those discussions, but some I didn't, and I'm very sorry that I didn't. That character was a product of the time and accepted by the culture, especially by men, not so much by women. Good point. Thank goodness it's hard to make a case now for that kind of insulting behavior. It's not acceptable, ipso facto, and that's progress. I'm glad he sees a lot of progress. Uh, you and Arlene got married 63 years ago. What's your secret? Uh, all the says, Arlene's answer is that the secret to a long marriage is a short memory. I'll repeat. The secret to a long marriage is a short memory. My answer, love. 
even when you're yelling at the person and there will be yelling, keep in mind that this is the person you love more than anything. That changes your tone. So you don't say, I hate you. You say, Alden starts singing, I hate you so. No, he says it like this. I hate you. And then uh, get back to the proper tone when you're talking to people. You have three children and seven grandchildren. Are you optimistic about their future? Uh, with the world changing so rapidly, there's no point in being optimistic or pessimistic about anything. I don't know. I'm kind of pessimistic about my daughter's future here uh, because of the climate change. But God bless us all. Uh, you just got to serve uncertainty because it's all we got. A question I ask around the dinner table with friends is, how long do you think our species will last? Uh, scientists tell me the average species when you factor in dinosaurs uh, and fruit flies and everything else last about two million years. So my question is, do you think we'll be lucky enough to be average? If we're not careful, we can kill each other off. And if we're not smart enough to take care of what nature has in store for us, who knows how long we'll last. Yeah, important, serious thoughts. That's why I like um, sharing interviews and articles with you because there are some interesting thoughts for discussion I'd like you to have. Uh, remember, this is Kevin Stoddard on the porch. Last question for all the all the was. So, what's the best thing for humans to do? Laugh. Laughter is good. That's one of the greatest benefits of this isolation. My wife and I are laughing more than we ever have. When you laugh, you're vulnerable. You're opening yourself up. You're not protected. That's why a lot of executives don't laugh much because they think it gives up their strength. Uh, but you gain so much through vulnerability. You let the other person in and that brings us all closer. We can't take ourselves too seriously even now. A good friend emailed me recently and said, Alan, how are you doing? How's everything? I wrote back and said, I'm still alive. If that changes, I'll let you know. All right. Thanks, Alan Alda, for that interview and uh, the magazine ARP that shares it with us. I uh, appreciate that kind of detail in an article. And I hope you take time to read it, too, if you find it online. That's Alan Alda has a message. Uh, thank you for listening. You can give comments at the bottom of the page. I'd love it. Uh, anything you find interesting about what you're watching and um, shout out to those watching right now and I want you to uh, subscribe to my channel there's a variety of, uh, of sharings from media and my life uh, and um, education and all kinds of important topics uh, that I'd like you to be involved in uh, with your friends and family and uh, thank you for subscribing uh, give me a thumbs up and I hope you have a great weekend or week.